and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have a neck run like a chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> I have one policy, this man said, to wage war against tyranny with all my strength. What is my aim? I can answer in one word, victory. His name is Winston Churchill, and this is his biography. I'm Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Winston Churchill. During the Second World War, Winston Churchill was more than the Prime Minister of Great Britain. To all the embattled Allied nations, he was a symbol of defiance and freedom. We saw Churchill today, a sailor wrote to his family. You would sense greatness in him even if you were seeing him for the first time. It is there, he said, in Churchill's face. Washington, December 1941, two weeks after Pearl Harbor. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain, arrived at the White House for strategy conferences with President Roosevelt. Now, Churchill's hope for Anglo-American alliance has suddenly become a reality. Back in London, Churchill assures his people that American might can tip the scales in the war against Germany. Churchill knows that the entire five strategy depends on the outcome of what he calls the Battle of the North Atlantic. But the United States cannot join the fight in Europe as long as Hitler controls the Atlantic sea lanes. Huge merchant convoys sail from the United States and Canada with arms and supplies for Britain. But a tragically small percentage of these ships ever reach their destination. Nazi U-boats are the masters of the North Atlantic. And against these silent raiders, the lightly armed merchant ships are all but defenseless. entire Allied convoys are wiped out. In a single month, 142 ships are lost. And so, in a desperate effort to break the Atlantic stranglehold, the Allies throw everything they have into anti-submarine warfare. Convoys grow larger and faster. Heavily armed escort forces accompany them. Above, long-range patrol planes utilize a new British invention called radar. Now the U-boat packs can be hunted and destroyed before they can attack. convoys slip through to safety. The trickle of supplies reaching England begins to grow. It's 
soon become... Hitler's blockade of the North Atlantic has been broken. But early in 1942, despite American aid, the British Army in Africa has been overrun by the Nazis. Singapore and Malaya have fallen to the Japanese, and Britain's strategic position in the Far East is threatened. In Parliament, Churchill and his cabinet are accused of mismanaging the war. The opposition moves to censure Churchill, but the Prime Minister answers his critics with blunt honesty. I have never promised anything about blood, tears, toil, and sweat. The Parliament and the nation respond to Churchill's frankness. The censure motion is voted majority. From this moment, Churchill's leadership is unquestioned. Moscow, August 12, 1942. Although traditional enemies, Britain and Russia are now allied against Hitler. Churchill arrives for his first talks with Joseph Stalin. In North Africa, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel leads an undefeated Nazi army. The British soldiers call him the Desert Fox, and many of them believe that Rommel is invincible. The British 8th Army against Rommel, Churchill picks the battle-wise veteran of Dunkirk, General Bernard Montgomery. A soldier's life is hard, Montgomery remarks. After years of effort, one takes command in a hopeless situation. Of course, he adds, I was speaking of Rommel. El Alamein in the Egyptian desert. Montgomery risks his whole army in an all-out attack. spreads along a front of more than 50 miles, and the fighting rages for days. After more than a week of attack and counterattack, Montgomery finally receives word that Rommel's line has been broken, and that the Nazis are in disorganized retreat. What Churchill calls the hinge of fate at Alamein has given the Allies a sweeping victory. Before El Alamein, Churchill says, we never won a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat. Confidence, and he is quick to share it with his people. Against the triumphant might of Hitler, with a greedy Italian at his tail, <laughs> we stood alone with resources so slender that one shudders to enumerate them even now. So far, they have only been subjected to preliminary and discursive bombardment. But uh, they are already speculating feverishly where the blow will fall. It is no part of our business to relieve their anxiety or uncertainty. November, Churchill meets with Stalin and Roosevelt at the Tehran conference. But this is a frustrating meeting for Churchill. 
Now, huge Russian and American forces are carrying the biggest burden in the fighting. The Prime Minister of the British Empire finds himself the junior member of the Big Three. And to add to Churchill's frustration throughout this crucial meeting, he has laryngitis and he cannot speak above a whisper. But by the end of the conference, a massive offensive has been planned. The Russians will step up their drive toward Germany from the east, and England will become the base for an invasion of France. Eager to participate in the invasion, Churchill flies to Tunis for talks with Eisenhower. But his aides are concerned about his health. The prime minister is pale and listless. I'm tired out, he says, body, soul, and spirit. Frightening news reaches London. Churchill is critically ill. The people of Britain falter for the first time in the war. Through their darkest hours, Churchill has inspired them with his dream of victory. Now, the worst has passed. But it seems that Winston Churchill may not live to see that dream become reality. December 1943. For four days, the world waits for news from Tunis, where Winston Churchill lies near death. Finally, Christmas Day, 1943. The Prime Minister is jubilant on his return to London. He tells reporters he was rescued from his deathbed by a mixed diet of sulfur drugs and brandy. Now Churchill plunges into planning for the invasion of France. His old enthusiasm and zest quickly return. He can remember when England was in a state of siege, fighting for her existence. Now the tide has turned. England is the base for the greatest invasion army of modern times. As the invasion date approaches, the High Command learns that Churchill and Eisenhower are having a disagreement. Churchill insists that he will occupy a ringside seat on D-Day. He plans to be aboard a British cruiser, which will support the landing in France. Eisenhower says it is far too dangerous, but Churchill is determined. Finally, the King of England personally requests that Winston Churchill stay in London on D-Day. Reluctantly, the Prime Minister gives in. In London on the afternoon of D-Day, the British public learns that the Allies have landed on the beaches of Normandy. On that fateful day, the Prime Minister's face tells the story. The news from Normandy is excellent. The invasion is going well. After a few days, Churchill can no longer be restrained. He sets off for Normandy to survey the situation for himself. Four years ago, a bruised and demoralized Allied army barely escaped from these shores. Now, Churchill can proudly say that Dunkirk has been avenged. aboard a destroyer, he asks the captain to approach a stretch of French coast still held by the Nazis. Running dangerously close to shore, the destroyer bombards the German defenses. Altogether, Churchill writes with satisfaction, it had been a most interesting and enjoyable day. During the final phases of the war, Churchill is a constant and welcome visitor at the front. No allied soldier can forget that this man once stood alone against Hitler. His courage and defiance marked the birth of this crusade in Europe. In the spring of 1945, Germany finally collapses. Russian troops enter the devastated city of Berlin. On May 8, 1945, there is...
there's peace in Europe. Churchill travels to a summit meeting at Potsdam to discuss the new peace in Europe and the final phases of the war against Japan. But Churchill leaves Potsdam in the middle of the conference. He returns to London to receive the results of England's first general election in 10 years. Clement Attlee, the relatively unknown leader of the Labour Party, is Churchill's opponent at the polls. The election result is a foregone conclusion. Churchill is the most beloved English statesman of modern times. He has already made arrangements to return to Potsdam for further talks as soon as his victory is confirmed. Then the incredible election result is announced. At a time when the English people seem to love him most, they have turned Churchill and his party out of office. In Potsdam, Clement Attlee now takes Churchill's place with the big three. A stunned world asks, where is Winston Churchill? Deeply hurt, but far from broken, Winston Churchill has gone home. 71 years old now, he begins to write a monumental six-volume history of the Second World War. Finally free of the burdens of government, he rediscovers the joys of private life. Churchill embraces a growing family. He loves babies and is reported to have remarked with surprise, they all look like me. with honors, but he is expected to behave himself now, to retire quietly from political controversy. But Churchill will not cooperate with those who wish to retire him. Throughout an American speaking tour in 1946, he emphasizes that he does not intend to become a docile elder statesman. Do you not think you are running some risk in, in inviting me to give my faithful counsel on this occasion. Uh, you have not asked to see beforehand what I'm going to say. Uh, I might easily, for instance, blurt out a lot of things uh, which people know in their hearts are true, but are a bit shy of saying in public. <laughs> and, and this might cause a, a regular commotion and get you all into trouble. A week later, visiting a small Missouri college, Churchill speaks out and becomes the first great statesman to warn that the Cold War is more than an unpleasant diplomatic scuffle. He coins a phrase that will become famous. This is the historic Iron Curtain speech. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. This is certainly not the liberated Europe we fought to build up. 
To many, Churchill's views on Russia seem impulsive, even dangerous in 1946. He is called an alarmist. Communist-inspired demonstrators picket his New York hotel. But Churchill is the first to hope that Russia will work for world peace. In 1951, Churchill is back in the thick of politics. Abroad, Russia has become even more belligerent. And at home, Britain's labor government is faltering in the face of a severe economic crisis. At 77, Churchill intends to be prime minister once again. Through the campaign, he shows little sign of his advancing age. But on the eve of the election, he tells the public frankly, I pray indeed that I may have this opportunity. It is the last prize I seek to win. Election night. Labor takes an early lead. But gradually, the conservatives gain. And when the results are finally posted, Winston Churchill has won his last prize. Churchill has been prime minister for three successful years. It is rumored that he will soon resign. To celebrate her coronation, Queen Elizabeth has made Churchill a Knight of the Garter. On his 80th birthday, both houses of parliament assemble to congratulate Sir Winston. He is presented with two gifts, a book containing the signatures of all the members of parliament and a portrait of himself. A discriminating art critic, Churchill doesn't care for the painting. The portrait is a remarkable example of modern art. which no active member of either house can do without or should fear to meet. Sir Winston Churchill spends the twilight of his life in southern France. He is glimpsed occasionally painting or walking on the beach. Churchill has passed beyond mere fame. Less than a decade after his retirement, the world has recognized Sir Winston Churchill as a giant of history. And historians find in Churchill's own words their highest tribute. One of them writes, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to one unconquerable man. Churchill says, it was the nation that had the lion's heart. I simply had the luck to be called upon to give the lion's roar. In his 80s, Winston Churchill still held a seat in the House of Commons. And when a young colleague proposed that Churchill retire from Parliament and make way for a younger man, he was told by another member, the mere knowledge that Sir Winston is one of our number adds grandeur to all our efforts. Mike Wallace for Biography.